want to welcome you to the church of what kind of God? Living God. What kind of God? Living God. Living God. Amen. If you have a Bible, get it out. Everybody got your Bible. Now loosen it up, you know, do it like this. Get it all loosened up and then turn over to the book of Matthew. I mean, book of uh, Ephesians chapter three, if you will. The book of Ephesians chapter three. Now, uh, there should be some printed lessons. If you did not get one, anybody need a printed lesson? Did everybody get a copy of that? <clears throat> All right, if you have it, now let's turn over to, if you will, uh, let me find it, to Ephesians, and let's go to chapter 3, if you will. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when, you, when, when a preacher preaches, that's inspiration. Now, inspiration will touch your heart, and I, I can preach. If you turn me loose, I can really preach. I love to preach. But one, guy, one day, uh, and this is so long ago, it has to be at least 40 years ago in my life, the Lord told me if now if I was going to pastor, I had to learn how to teach. And teaching is information. Preaching is inspiration. And so when I learned how to teach, I met a lot of interesting people along the way, uh, people that uh, influenced my life quite a bit. <laughs> Kenneth E. Hagin was one of the ones that influenced my life, that taught me a lot. That's senior. And then John Osteen, he was a great preacher. Uh, anybody, and we were personal friends with him. He even come down and, and helped the service when my first wife passed away. And uh, then I had uh, people like Bob Yandian that put into my life. I, I didn't, he was a distance away, of course, and then I bought all of his books and tapes and uh, I educated myself. Now, again, <clears throat> you'll not really grow in the Lord. You'll not be a person of faith until you study the Word of God. Now, uh, faith cometh by what? Hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So faith cometh by, listen to me, hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, and then one day you say, huh, I understand that. And it's line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, here's some over here, here's some over there, and you put it together and you formulate the doctrine. Now, I was very fortunate in my younger days uh, I had a pastor, a Baptist pastor, A.L. Bird, uh, that he had preached to his own Sunday, and he was as good a preacher as I find. And we would always stake ourselves out in the congregation, and uh, we was always interested in souls. We was a soul-winning church. We prayed for the lost. We wept over the lost. And so when he gave an invitation, he had asked us one by one to slowly get up, not come all at the same time. And it would cause people to get courage to go and accept the Lord. And, when, you know, for my personal life, I've seen thousands of people born again. Trey's father preached in the Philippines where he had over 5,000 saved, and I got to be a part of all of that. And so consequently, the object of what we're doing is to teach people the Word of God that they might hear, and faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And then when I was real young, remember I used to be young, and I used to have black hair, uh, real, real dark brown hair. You could call it black. And I uh, started getting gray when I was about 16, 15 years old. And so consequently, I used to be young. And now I'm old. And the Bible says, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed breaking bread. In other words, I have been young and I'm old and I'm not begged for bread. I know what God says. It said, it said to me, now bring you all the tithes into the storehouse and uh, honor him. And uh, as I honored him, he honored me. I learned how to sow seeds. You know, there's times that I just see people and God said, I want you to sow seeds in that person's life. Uh, there's things that I give people, money I give to people and sowing the seed. So casting seeds out and they come back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now, the word of God is something that I love. I love the word of God. And one of the things I found out early on, now this, I got saved in 57. By 1960 or so, I had begun to learn what I'm teaching you. I've always looked for the Lord to come. It may be morning, may be noon, may be night, but one day soon Jesus is coming. And it's called the blessed hope for you and I. Now, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're all people most miserable, the Bible says. Now, hope is what keeps us alive. Hope what makes our faith work. Without hope, your faith will not work. Uh, I've been at the bed of people dying, and when they give up hope, you can see a person just prior to dying, they'll give up hope, and they'll die. You see, hope is very important. I remember one time in the body of Christ, they, they, they got to teaching, you know, crazy stuff gets to be taught. They said hope was a, four, dirty letter, a dirty four-letter word. 
And they tried to take it out, but that's what keeps my faith going. And I want you to know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, last week I began, and we're going to kind of review just a little bit. I began to teach you about dispensation. Now, <clears throat> God has a plan. This is last week, and I'll get into this week. And I'll teach until he asks me to stop, and then when he asks me again, I'll pick back up on this stuff. Now, God has a plan, and no matter what man does, God's plan is going to be fulfilled. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then last week we talked to you about uh, dispensation. Now the word dispensation is found in your Bible. The word, it is in your Bible. And we found out that last week the dispensation really means an administration. So to make it understandable to you, we elect the president every four years. He has a four-year term, or she, whichever it might be, and then they can get reelected and have eight years. The governor's the same way. We have mayors here in Galveston. They're elected two years, and they can run three times, and they can have six-year term. So uh, a dispensation means an administration. It means a period of time. Now, God has set up seven dispensations, and these dispensations, God always starts them good, and man tears them up. Everybody hold your finger up. Everybody hold your finger up. Come on, put it on up. Come on. Get it up high. All right, now I know you're doing. Now put it on your nose. Yes. Say, I found my problem. In other words, you can stop blaming anybody else. You found your problem. And so consequently, when you begin to dis, uh, discuss uh, dispensation, it says in the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says in the Old Testament, he spoke by the prophets. But in the New Testament, he speaks to us by his son. And then we found out over as we turn over into the book of uh, Hebrews in chapter 2, it says, every dispensation was like this. Now, you wear clothes and you wear them out. You wash them and you fold them and you wear them and you fold them. And eventually, don't bring them to the church to give away. They're wore out. And you throw them away. And that's what happened to every dispensation. God started it good and then man messed it up. Now, man is a problem taking place. In other words, you are a problem many times, and you cause your own problems most of the time. And so consequently, a man without Jesus Christ is just taking place. All right? You, you understand. But a person that has Jesus Christ in his heart, he has the ability to overcome. There's no temptation common, but it's common toward man. But God has made a way for us to overcome. Many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from part of them. From 90% of them. No. Delivers them from what? From what? All of them. Now, you're going to have problems. Don't worry about it. You get up in the morning and some of the problems are just you. You get up and it's your wife the next time. Or your children. Or your work. Or whatever. But you will have problems. And then we see the last day. There's a term last day. And it's spoken of in Acts chapter 2, and it's a, prophesy, a prophecy or word spoke out of Joel. And it says, in the last days, your young men and your young ladies will have visions, and the old men will have dreams, and he'll pour out his spirit upon us. And so consequently, uh, we study it now, the fact we're living, and let me give you the uh, dispensation to all of them. The first one was innocent, and that was in the Garden of Eden. The second one was conscious, that's with Cain and Abel. The third one was human government, and that's after the flood. And then the fourth one was promise, and that was to Abraham. And he, God gave Abraham a promise, and he gave him covenants. Now, some of the covenants, whether people like it or not, no matter who, what you talk to, people you talk to, God gave, them, gave Abraham some uh, everlasting covenants, and one of them was the land. You know, Israel has a land promised to them, and they will have it. And he gave him a covenant and promised him that he would have a son. And through that son, <clears throat> Isaac would be brought forth Jesus Christ into the world. And all those the eternal promises that he gave. Now, there's some others. But when the law came, the covenant was based upon, if you do this, I will do this. God gave a law. He said, if you'll do this, I'll do this. In other words, in other words we found out that most of the time we won't do our part in what God has asked us to do. And then a lot of people in the church today, they think that the keeping of the law is how you get saved. 
But now, like I told you last week, in the law, there's three parts of the law. Do you know there's a law of commandments? And that's called the Ten Commandments. Do you know there's a law of sacrifice? And I want to ask you, when is the last time you brought an animal down here to Pastor Trey and had him to kill that animal and offer it as a sacrifice? You have not done it. And see, if you're going to keep one of the law, you have to keep all of the law. And then there's a law of hygiene. That's cleanliness. In other words, you're going to have to keep all of it. Do you know why the Jews survived many pandemics? Do you understand why? Do you know why they survived the pandemic in Spain back in the 1400? Because of hygiene. That's the reason the Spain expelled them out of the country. Because the Spaniards were dying and the Israelites were living. Simply, everything they've asked us to do. Now, what have they asked us to do during this pandemic? Wash your hands. I mean, you know, you need to wash your hands even if you pick your nose. You need to wash your hands and keep it clean. And so consequently, you know, they want us to wear a mask. And when I'm out in some places, I'll put a mask on. And so there's all kinds of problems. But now keeping of the law, you cannot do because there's no priest and there's no high priest. And so what God did in the dispensation of the grace of God, he made us priests. And in Revelation, he said he's made us priests and kings. And he made us priests, it says in the book of uh, Peter, that you have become a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so when I sin, I don't have to go hunt up somebody to confess my sins to. If I confess my sin, God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I don't have to go find a priest. I am a priest. I am a king. I reign in God. And you know, I found out that I'm sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. You think about our judicial system. Now, just think about it just a minute. You have a DA. He's the, called the prosecutor. You have the defense lawyer, and uh, he defends you in the cases brought against you. And then you have a judge. And of course, you have a jury, but you can choose a judge if you want to. You don't have to have a jury. And so consequently, our system is based upon biblical principle. Now, the Bible says that the devil has access uh, to the throne of God. And the Bible says that he accused the brothers and the sisters. He accuses us daily before the throne. So this is how it works. The devil is the DA. He is the prosecutor. And he goes before the throne of God probably every day with me because, you know, I'm a problem child. He goes there and he says, you know that Robert Dowdy down there in Texas City, Texas, do you know him? He done, da, 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 whatever, you know, he's accusing me of. And then, <clears throat> remember, when you are set on a jury, after you listen to the prosecutor, the guy or her or whatever, they're just guilty as dirt until you hear the defense attorney. And so we have a defense attorney called Jesus. He sat seated at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that I am seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's my position tonight. I happen to just be hanging out with you guys. Are you, you listening to me? And so, you know, in my Texas term, God turns to Jesus, the defense lawyer, and says, uh, what do you think about that Robert Dowdy? He is innocent. He's totally free of sin. He's been given, forgiven past, present, and into the future. And God takes his hammer and goes whack on the devil's head, I think. And then uh, he says the case is dismissed. What's the next case? I want you to know we cannot lose for winning. Can you listen to me now? And then we studied about the grace of God. Now it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. And then if I, if I last long enough and we have enough time before the year is over, I'll teach you about the kingdom age. That's one of the lessons, and you'll have a lesson there. Now, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, the key to me understanding the rapture is found basically in Ephesians and basically in the scriptures called the mystery teaching. Now, when I was real young, back in the 50s, and when I first read the Bible, you know, I never read a Bible in my life until I got born again. I never picked one up, never read it. I did not have it read to me. I don't blame anybody. I could have got up and went to church myself. They was close by. And so consequently, when, when I read the Bible and I'd read the word mystery, at first, 
It just meant it was a mystery. It wasn't supposed to be understood. And so consequently, when I'd read more in there, then I bought me. Now, you know, everybody ought to have a good reference Bible. Just reading the Bible is not good enough. You understand? Just reading is good. You need to read the Bible. You know, I tell people, read the Bible down to jail. I scare the hell out of you. Some of y'all are real slow. I tell them, just read the Bible. It might scare the hell out of you. Come on. You say, I can't believe he said it. Well, just believe it. You understand? Just believe it. And you get a reference Bible and you begin to study and then you begin to learn some things. You buy a concordance. You buy other materials that you can have. And so consequently, you put it together. Now, we found out that the word dispensation means an administration. It's the period of time of how God cover, covers the period of time. God starts it good and man messes it up. Now, let's go to Ephesians, if you will, chapter 3. And let's go down to verse number 1 and we'll read. He says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to stop right there and look at me just a minute. You know, I made a great discovery in my life one time. As I was reading through the epistles, and I noticed that the Bible says Jesus Christ sometimes. And then I noticed it says Christ Jesus sometimes. Have y'all ever noticed that? Did you ever you give it any thought? All right. Now, usually speaking, and I, w- I looked up a lot of verses, I found out when it says Jesus Christ, it starts with his humanity working to his deity. All right. Now, let's take, like, listen to this. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by what? Christ Jesus. It starts with his deity and comes into his humanity. So when you read it sometimes, uh, you look at it, and maybe you might think, well, maybe he got tired of saying Jesus Christ. He wanted to say Christ Jesus. So it has a meaning when you read it. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Uh, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, uh, which is given unto me to you, word, how that the, by the revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Uh, for as I wrote a four and a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mysteries of Christ, which in other, now I read out of the King James, so it says, and by which in the other ages. Now that word ages would be dispensations or administration which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it now revealed unto us by the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. He said, Wherefore I have made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am least and all the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship. Now that word again there would be dispensation of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right, so he says now there was something hidden from ages past. Now listen to me, the word mystery in the Greek, it means mysterion. And it means the truth hidden God revealed. You know, there's something we're going to read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in a minute. Had the devil known what would t- take full of place, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. In other words, there's some things that was hid in the heart of God revealed. Now, I read to you in Matthew 24, verse 36 last week, that no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Even Jesus does not know the time when he'll come back to the earth. And it's reserved for God. Now, why do you think some of this? Because, you know, when you open your mouth too much, you let know what's in your heart. And sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut. Excuse me. And you need to say what's, what God says and not what you think. Because out of your mouth will come the confession that's down into your heart. When Pastor Trey told us that nobody in our church would die from coronavirus. He first said it. I heard him first yes. say it back yonder. Immediately faith come up in my heart. Yes. I love that song. I'm no longer a child of fear. I am a child of God. I want you to know when he said that, I said to myself, you will not have coronavirus. Do you understand? What part of that do you not understand? 
And I've helped to that. Now, I take precautions. I'm not stupid. I didn't wake up stupid this morning. I take precaution. But I want you to know I will not die from coronavirus. Amen. Now, we can see that he talked about a mystery, and that mystery was hidden Christ. Now, we can read in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter uh, 9 and verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and his government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, for us, a child is born. But later on now, when he comes back the second time, the government will be upon his shoulder. So it talks about the New Testament and the kingdom age there. You need to know the periods of time that God is speaking about and what he is speaking about. Now, we can see, <clears throat> let's look at verse 6 now of this uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 3, that the Gentiles should be what? Fellow heirs of the same bodies and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. All right, now I want you to hold your place there. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, if you will. Go to Matthew chapter 13. All right, now this is where the word mystery is first mentioned. In other words, the word mystery means, now listen to me, it means a truth, truth, truth hidden God revealed. It means something that God had in his heart that he did not reveal until the time. So it means, really, it means this, a truth hidden God in the past revealed at a certain time. And so he first revealed it in the book of Matthew. Now, let me give you kind of a breakdown. I don't want to read too many scriptures to you uh, out of Matthew. But in Matthew 13, you have to go back. What comes before 13? What? What comes before 13? 12, doesn't it? So you go back to chapter 12, and he was about to get put out at the Jews. Because, you know, he went out and plucked corn, and he said it's on the Sabbath day. He healed somebody on the Sabbath day. He began to say that. Now, there's three things that you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. You need to be aware of the leaven of the Sadducees. And you need to be weary of the leaven of the Herodians. Now, the leaven of the Pharisees, well, they put you under condemnation. The Sadducees, that they did not believe in miracles, and the Herodians, they wanted to put you under a world system. Now, pastor says he's not a Democrat. He's not a Republican. He understand. He's a child of God. And we need in the church, we need to understand that. Now, I'll, I'll vote a certain way. You understand? I have a choice that I've won. And I'm an American citizen. That's one of the greatest, I think, a privilege I have in America is to get to vote. But you understand now, <coughs> when, you're, when you're thinking about that, you're a child of God. And you're not a child of this world system. We're not governing. And about, we're going to find out that we're ambassadors. Uh, one of the mysteries is that we're ambassadors upon the earth. And an ambassador's never governed by the land they sent to. And they're never supplied their sources by the land they live in. They're supplied their sources by the country they come from. And I'm a child of the king. And I have a residence in heaven. And I want you to know God will correct me. And God will supply my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, I, I, you know, we all have days like this, kind of thinking about our finances. And I was concerned about this. You know, all the dumbness that we go through. And uh, I was going to get me a haircut. And I normally just call. And I said, you know, I need a haircut. I'm looking kind of shabby. And uh, we call it ears lowered, you know. Some people say, what do you say, ears lowered? <laughs> and, uh, and usually I just call and uh, so that day, I, I just felt I needed to go there. And, and where I went to first, I must have prayed for seven or eight people down at the jail. You, it, it's just unbelievable what's going on with me. And uh, so I run down there to the beautician, and I went in there. And, and I like to aggravate. Ask Trey. Ask my wife. I love to aggravate. I love to challenge people. I'm just, well, forgive me. Just laugh at me if you want to. But some of you are the same way. And so consequently, I went in there. And I was aggravating and, you know, trying to get me a time and, and just, you know, having a good time. The person in the beauty chair, chair she was getting the hair and she was pulling it back. I said, you look like my wife. You got some uh, gray showing there. <laughs> that already gets you in trouble, didn't it? <laughs> and she said, Pastor Dowdy, I'm sick and I'm going to have surgery. You would come down here today to pray for me. I said, I sure did. And I prayed for him. And then I got ready to walk out and somebody come gave me several hundred bucks. 
because I was concerned about something that God knew I had a need of. And I want you to know you're an ambassador of Christ. You've been sent into this world uh, to uh, affect the world and God will supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he'll get me home to take care of my judgment because <laughs> we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of things we did in our body, both good and bad. And some of it will be wood, hay and stubble, and some of it will be gold, silver and precious stone, and it'll be lit in the fire. And I want you to know I'm going to have gold and silver and precious stone. Yes. I better get back over where it was. <laughs> and so we see now, uh, he, they was arguing, a girl, you know, boy got the devil cast out of him, and, and they wouldn't put anything in him. It was like the Jewish people, he got it cast out. And then in, in chapter 13, it says this, the same day Jesus went out of the house, and you can ride under there, that house, that's the house of Israel. And he went and sat down by the seaside, and that's the, if it doesn't say a certain sea, it means the Gentile people. So he left the house of Israel because of their unbelief. Now listen, folks, God does not like, does not like unbelief. Amen. Amen. That's right. You remember King Saul. God told him to kill every man, woman, boy, girl, animals. And he brought back a bunch of sheep because he thought he was going to please God. Listen, the only thing that pleases God is faith. Amen. And the only thing that pleases God is your obedience to what God said to do. Come on, don't shout me down. You know I'm right. Yes. Well, preacher. You're accusing me. Well, just get over it and <laughs> repent. And he went down and he sat by the sea and a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he went into the ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables. Now, the word of parable is really, if I pronounce it parable lay, it means a truth. Now, listen to me. Thrown down alongside. And you that have an ear will hear and understand. And so the first parable is just the sowing of the seed. Do you know that's what we do? We just sow the seed. We just cast it out. We pray for people. We just cast that word out. And then we can see that talks about the church age. That's what you're doing. And then the second parable, mystery that's spoken of, is the tares among the wheat. And when you study that, that'll tell you about the tribulation. And then the third one is the grain of mustard seed. And that's, again, about the church. And then the fourth one is the leaven. Now, listen, he, he warned us about the leaven of three things. Now, listen to me again. He said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. That's condemnation. Be le wary of the leaven of the Sadducees. They didn't believe in a resurrection. Wouldn't that be sad? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, this would be a miserable place to have to stay in the rest of my life. I mean, the rest of the time. And he said, be weary of the leaven of the Herodians. That's the governments of the earth down here. He said, you beware of that. And that talks about the church age. And then he gives the explanations of the second one that next come along. And then he said the fifth one would be like a, uh, the kingdom of heaven. It's like unto a treasure hid in the field. Uh, the, uh, the which when the man had found, uh, he, he hideth it. And for joy, he goeth and sell it all that he had. And he buyeth the field. Now that one right there is talking about the Jews. They're like a treasure. Remember on their breastplate, they had the 12 stones. And they're like a treasure hid in the earth. And I read last week now to you, in Luke 21, they had two diasporums. The first one they had sent to Babylon because they wouldn't let the land rest for 490 years, every seven years, and they owed the land 70 years. So God took them out, sent them to Babylon, and let the land rest. In other words, it's better to obey than it is to sacrifice. And then they're, they're like a treasure because in Luke 21, the last diaspora, he said he had sent them into all the world. I've been to 26 nations and every nation I went to, I inquired, are there Jews here? And every nation I was in, there's Jews. They're scattered everywhere. And they're like a treasure hid in the earth. And then the sixth mystery was the pearl. Now the pearl represents the church. Now the pearl, if you know anything about pearls, you read about it, it's one little grain of sand, irritating grain of sand. It begins to uh, wind its way around until it becomes a shell and it becomes a pearl. And Jesus said, 
I, in, in Matthew 16, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he talks about us being a pearl hid in the sea, being built. And he's building those layer upon layer upon layer until one day we're completely built. And he's going to take us out as a bride. And then the last one is about the tribulation. And that's about the seven mysteries uh, and the dragnet. Now, again, when you study the mysteries, it's a, now remember, it means a truth hid revealed. It's a truth hid in God revealed. Now, let's go back over here to my notes. And it says about the mystery teaching. Now, uh, this is B on page three of the first page of the notes. Now, the mystery teaching of the New Testament that is given to the church, first of all, uh, about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that's in Matthew 13. You can find it in Mark 11, 4, and Luke 8. Then the blindness of Israel. When you go read uh, Romans chapter 11, chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul, he stops. He, in the first eight chapters of that, he teaches about justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And I want you to know, once you've been justified, you know you're saved. It's just as if you never sinned. And then he pauses, and he has three chapters about the nation of Israel. And the chapters was that God has not forgot about them. There's a blindness upon them right now. They cannot see. They cannot, they're blinded right now to the gospel. They're all Jews being saved today. But by and large, the nation is blinded. But God said he, in Luke 21, that he had scattered them into the world until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, the gathering of the Gentiles, the, it's called the fullness of the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, the church will be taken out, and then he'll go again, and he'll begin to uh, deal with the uh, uh, Gentile nations upon what they did to Israel, and he'll judge Israel, and it's called the tribulation. Now, we can see, he said, uh, for Rome, I mean, for Israel, they have a blindness on the eye. And then the salvation is in Christ. I so want you to take your Bible, turn over to the book of Romans, if you will. Let's go over to the book of Romans. And let's go down to uh, chapter 16, if you will. Now, this is the one, when I read it, this is the one that just opened my eyes to understanding of the mystery. Now, let's go down here. And when I first read it, Paul called it his gospel. And I thought, boy, that's arrogant. When you're young, you don't know too much. But when you read it, it says, now, uh, look at verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to the, my gospel and to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest by the scriptures and the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now he said there was something. Now look at me just a minute. There was something God had hid and that was the mystery. The mystery is a truth God had hid revealed. And when Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day, I told you last week, that 490 years that Daniel said from the time they left Israel until the time that Jesus would come back the second time. Now, remember, I, I mentioned to you last week, from Abraham to David was 490 years. From David to Babylonian was 490 years. And when Daniel said in Daniel chapter 9, when you leave here, uh, there will be another 490, 70 weeks. There'll be another 490 years. And so we see they went back and built the city and they went back and Christ was born and he was crucified. And 69 of those weeks or 483 of those weeks were fulfilled. But he was cut off, but not for himself. So I, I take it like this. God has a stop clock. And at 483 years from the time they left Babylon, or 69 weeks, God went up there and went click and stopped the clock. And when Jesus was crucified and died and resurrected from the dead and seated in heaven, you know, he come back and visit for a while. And when he was called up, remember they said, uh, uh, they said, where are you going? And the angel said, he's ascending up, but he's going to come back in light matter. He reached over there in Acts chapter 2 and clicked on another 
stopwatch, so to speak. And the time of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles has been coming in for 2,000 years, a little bit over 2,000 years now. And I want you to know that clock is ticking. But one of these days, Jesus is going to come with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise up. And we which are alive will be changed in a moment in the twinkle of the eye. And then Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. What is that? A truth hidden God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We'll not all die or all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. Moment means time that cannot be further divided down. Like we took a, a material, we divided it down to an atom. That's where you get the atom bomb, okay? It divided it down, and it means time that cannot be further divided down. In a moment, it, it, behold, I show you a mystery. We're not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. You know, one of these days, I'm going to have a body. It does not appear what I'm going to be like, but I'm going to be just like him, for I'll see him as he is. I'm going to have a full, recognizable body. Are you listening to me? And I'll know you. She won't be my wife. She'll be my sister in Christ. My mother won't be my mother. She'll be my sister in Christ. My daddy won't be my daddy. He'll be my brother in Christ. And I'll know them all. I'll get to see them. And you understand, uh, uh, this, is, this is something God has prepared. And so the church time is clicking right on down. And then one of these days when the rapture happens, he's going to call us up and he'll click that thing again. And he'll reach over here at a moment of time and he'll click on the seven years. Now, I want to I give you a likeness. Now, the likeness is like a Jewish wedding. Now, I'm going to give you briefly something. Now, a Jewish wedding is like this. Now, remember, the agriculture society was back in their days. It wasn't an industrial thing. So just dismiss your mind of our time. And in those days, boys were very important. They had large families. Girls was not necessarily as valuable except for dowry. And so the boy would go out and he'd find him a, you know, let's make it real, find him a good looking chick. And he'd go home and tell his dad. And his dad would go off a dowry, money exchange for the girl. And once the agreement came, then she was spoken for and she put a lantern in her window. And he went home to a pair of place for them to live, a honeymoon cottage. And that father would look at that cottage, and the boy, you know, he is anxious to get that girl over there. Come on, don't shut me down. I mean, come on, boys, your eyes are that big when you're looking and chasing? Oh, y'all are just stone <laughs> deaf. I believe y'all are half dead. And he said, Daddy, is it ready? Is it ready, Daddy? Is the house ready? Is the honeymoon part ready? <laughs> and Jesus said, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive thee unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Yes. And I tell you one day, that daddy will say, son, that place is ready. Go get your bride. And I want you to know that lantern will be lit. I want to ask you this, is your lantern lit? Yes. Do you have your light on? Are you ready for him to come? Are you looking forward to him coming? And I want you to know when they went, and they had the relationship, they became one flesh. And when they had that relationship, the next day, are you listening to me? They started a seven-day festival. And I want you to know Jesus is going to call us up. We're going to be married to the groom we're going to be presented to a groom without spot or wrinkle. We're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things we did in our body. And I tell you, we're going to start a seven-year festivity wow. called the Marriage Supper of the Lord. And I tell you, at the end of that, we're going to wipe our mouth off and say, you ready to go, chief? He said, yeah, get them horses ready. Some of them Yankees up there, they don't even know what a horse is. I was in the Navy, and they have some of them guys that in the Navy with, they didn't even know what a cow looked like, except my pictures. That's all right. Bless your heart. If you're from the north, I'll forgive you. And he said, we're going to come back, and we'll be saying this. King of kings, Lord of lords, King of kings, Lord of lords. 
And he's going to come back and put his foot on the Mount of Olives. He's going to split a waterway. And he's going to defeat the Antichrist. Yes. And I tell you, well, let's just get back to my subject. I must have lost something right here. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then uh, we find in, uh, once you go to 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 2. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I don't get very far. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go down to verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, uh, before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they knew it, uh, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. And we'll go on down. I will just mention to the rest of them. The mystery of the doctrine of Christ found in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, the gift of knowledge. Do you know the gift of knowledge is just running rapid in me right now. I wake up every morning. God will give me something that I can give the people. Uh, God, you know, I, I, I call people. I went to the beauty parlor because the word of knowledge. I, I go places. I pray for people. This is, this is one of the best times of my life. I, I'm not as able to get around like I used to, but God gave me a car. And, and, get, and I'm free with my time retired. And I'm praying for people. And I, I tell you, the half has not been told what's getting ready to take place. And, and then we can see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. The rapture of the church. I want you to know there is coming a rapture. Uh, and, and, and Timothy said in his writing, he said, now, Paul said, I, I, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. There's now laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not only for me, for all of those that love his appearing. One of the crowns I'm going to get, whatever I do with my crown, I'm going to get a crown of righteousness because I have been looking for him to come ever since 1957. And he's going to come one day. And then we can see the mystery of God's will, the church in Ephesians 3, uh, the mystery of Christ in men in Colossians 1, 27 to 6 and 7, uh, the mystery of the doctrine of Christ in Colossians 4 and 3, uh, the mystery of the spirit of lawlessness. And now we, we see this. It, lawlessness has broke out in the world, especially we're seeing it in our country. Uh, the mystery of, uh, of, of faith and the gospel. Uh, the mystery of the seven candlesticks in Revelation 1 and 20. Uh, the mystery of the priesthood of every believer. Uh, the mystery of Gentiles being fellow heirs in Christ uh, in, in Ephesians 3 and 6. And the mystery of iniquity spoken out in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now I'm going to go into the third, second lesson here for just a minute. And we can see now that again, <clears throat> the departure rapture. Now there's two comings of the Lord. Uh, in other words, there's a coming for us where he'll come out and he'll come and he'll break through the atmosphere. I think it was Bonnie, you asked the other night, last week, you said, what is this teaching on three heavens? Now I want to tell you what it is. The first heaven is the atmosphere pull of the earth. And it's the reign of Satan. He's the God of this world system here. And so consequently, the first heaven is the atmospheric pull of the earth right here. And then the second heaven is called the starry heaven. That's where the, uh, the space people are. They break through. Once you break through gravity, uh, grace, you know, gravity, then you get out into space and you're weightless, so to speak. Well, not so to speak, that's how you are. And then the third heaven is the presence of God. So the third heaven is wherever God is. And so we can see the three heavens. And uh, <clears throat> there's two comings of the Lord. There's one called the rapture, and then there's one called the second advent. Now the word rapture, when you just study the English word, it means this, to be overwhelmed with emotions. Overwhelmed with emotions. When I married my lovely wife here on the front row, I winked at her a couple of times here tonight. That's really called batting my eyes. Mother, mother used to tell me, now just wink, Bobby. I go. She said, wink, Bobby. I didn't learn how to wink until I was a teenager. And then I saw them girls. <laughs> how many of you know that'll make you wink? I thought we was in church, Pastor. Well, we are.
But there's an advent, that means an arrival. When I tell you I'll be here at 6.30, you can look for me at 6.15. You understand, I'm a very prompt person. But I worked for a person one time. He said, if I tell you to go somewhere and meet with people, and I met with politicians a lot. I didn't know how many know that was a trip. <laughs> <laughs> but the politicians of my days were different than today. Okay, he said, I want you to be there at least 15 minutes early. And that's what made me start being arriving. So there is a departure, which is a sudden departure. Behold, I show you a mystery. We're not all asleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. And then there is an arrival when he comes to the earth. When he comes in Revelation 19, we're going to come with him. And we'll be saying, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. And he'll come back. You know, we'll just be hanging around with him. He'll play his foot on the Mount of Olives because that when he left, they were at the Mount of Olives. And he said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up in heaven? This same Lord Jesus, which you see it going, will come in light manner. I've stood on the Mount of Olives. Rusty's been over there. And, uh, how many of y'all been to Israel? All right. You, you stood on the Mount of Olives. And I want you to know I went down to the Dead Sea, down to En Gedi. And you read about that in Ezekiel. And I stood there and I saw the valley going back to, uh, Is I mean, to Jerusalem. And I stood there and I got my Bible out and I read it to the people we were with. And I said, he's going to stand his foot on the Mount of Olives one day. And it's going to split a waterway all the way to the Dead Sea. And I got, how many of y'all been in the Dead Sea? Well, you just float, you lay on top. And uh, <clears throat> I said, it's going to bring the water all the way down to the Dead Sea and the fish will live again. And I stood in that very valley and I looked up there. I tell you, the half has not been told what God's getting ready to do for us and what he's doing uh, even now in our life. The believers are looking for the rapture, but the earth in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 26, they're looking for him to come to the earth. It says the whole creation groaneth and travaileth for the coming of the Lord. All the earth is crying out today. The earthquakes, the sea, uh, the, the planetary system, everything is groaning. The Bible says, Paul just wrote in chapter 8, in, beginning in verse 18, he said, all of creation is just groaning. What are they groaning for? The coming of the Lord. Because I want you to know he's going to come back the second time without sin unto salvation. And all of those that have trusted in him are still alive. He'll usher them into the kingdom of God here upon the earth. And he'll take the wicked off and they'll go into hell. And he'll judge them first and cast them into hell. He'll cast the old devil down there and be chained for a thousand years. And that gets further on down there. And I've run out of time. So come up and hit pastor and end this. And I need to stop. Praise God. Sometimes I feel like I just stick my mouth on a fire hose, Papa, when I listen to you. <laughs> Get me a drink. So, Father, thank you for all that have come out tonight, God. We thank you for this word. Let it go into our hearts, God. Let, it not, let us not just be hearers, God, but let us be doers of what we've heard today. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you again on Sunday. Sunday, Father's Day. Looking forward to it.